and I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, you know, the, it, any critic would say there can't be anything new in history. There just can't, especially after 200 and some years. Uh, every story's been told, and, and as an author, and I've, I've written about the 1700s, the terrible war that went on, off and on for years, and I thought I knew the story pretty well, and uh, uh, I got stood on my head and came to realize that there's something that has not been told, something big, something very intriguing that we're going to get into tonight, uh, something that happened right here in the Ohio Valley, right in Wheeling, uh, some of the events surrounded it, and so, uh, uh, and this story came to me, and I was telling Erica in the most uh, strangest ways, because it came to me from a, a Wyandotte Native American woman, uh, who matter-of-factly told me that I had everything wrong. And so, I'm going to get into that a bit here. I'm going to work off some notes uh, as we go along. There's a lot, a, a lot I want to cover. This is a, I'm going to talk about white captives who never came back. And we're going to get off the railroad tracks here because uh, history does not, has not dealt with it. There's nothing you can find in archives. There's nothing you can find in other books. Everything has been written from a certain perspective. And so uh, uh, I want to paint a picture here. Uh, I'm talking about this book, The White Indian. This book is experiential. This doesn't explain. I'm here tonight to explain it. But if you read this, I'm, it's a more narrative form. I had the help of the Wyandotte Indian Nation to write this, or I couldn't have done it, uh, and some Shawnee. Uh, they were people who were here. And so what I'm going to do tonight is explain, with a lot of words, to try and paint a picture of what life was like back then and what happened in the course of these wars. And, and so uh, uh, we'll get right into it. And the time period I'm talking about is the mid-1700s to late 1700s. There were four major wars that went on here. Uh, why war? This was Indian land. And so the things I'm going to tell you tonight uh, are not judgmental on my part. You're going to say, hey, he sounds pretty judgmental here. Um, I, I want to paint what the facts were because we today just can't grasp this from our, our point of view, really. There's nothing that equates to it. So, yeah, first, first war happened. And how these wars happened was this was Indian land. White people started coming into it. 1750s, 1760s, the Zanes arrived 1769. Uh, this was the home to the Delaware, the Shawnee, the Mingo, who were really Seneca, beautiful Seneca, and the Wyandotte. Uh, Wyandotte, I was telling Erica, Wyandotte stretched all, all across northern Ohio to Detroit. Uh, very big tribe, huge tribe. And uh, these people are gone. We don't have anyone here from those tribes tonight, I'm guessing. And they're in Oklahoma. So this series of wars, and there were four of them, and there was lulls in between, it was peace, but uh, Indians fought back. And that's something that the historians who wrote the first books, 1800 on, really didn't want to deal with and grasp. But this was somebody else's home, you see. And so, uh, uh, these wars went on, and I've written about them, and in the course of these wars, they were very terrible because we had two races, white, European, English-speaking, and Native American, Indian, uh, that did not understand each other. Uh, they were fought over land. When it comes down to it, you know, it, it, here's the proof today. There's no reservation. We own the land. You see, white people won. They drove, the Indians were in Oklahoma. Uh, so it was fought over land ownership. Uh, they wanted to protect their land. They fought for it and lost. Uh, these four wars went on and came to a conclusion with Indians being forced out. And so uh, in the course of this war, it was unlike anything. Not, you know, the last one, and let me just 
French and Indian War ended in 1760. There's a lull, 1763 to 64, Pontiac's Rebellion, Indian War. Uh, another 10 year period, 1774, Lord Dunmore's War, that started right up the river here. Uh, over in 75, 1777, American Revolution, Indians are backed by the British, and that goes on into uh, to the end of the American Revolution. And so, one of the things that happened in the course of these wars, Indians fought differently than white people. They didn't stand up and face each other, like in the movie The Patriot, and shoot each other down. They were outnumbered all the time. So they fought in a style of small unit tactics. They fought from ambush. They fought hit and run. Their belief was, we've asked white people to stay out of our land. They won't. Now we're going to drive them out, and we'll do it one cabin at a time. You say one. Burn it. it takes two years to build a cabin. You burn it down in, in a half an hour. And so. If a white man opposed them, they killed him. He was the enemy. But it's not true that they killed everybody. They captured and brought back to their villages hundreds and hundreds of people, of white people, who were living on the frontier, uh, who were the lower class of, of colonial society, who were there because land, they thought land was free for the taking. And so I thought I knew this story pretty well. And uh, a woman named Julie West from Wyandotte, Oklahoma, uh, wanted to buy, got a hold of me, wanted her to buy my three other books for their tribal headquarters. And we got to talking, and she said, oh, by the way, I've got a white ancestor from what's now Moorfield, West Virginia. You see, and I'm, I'm, that's up in the mountains. And, and I'm thinking, somehow I got it in my head, it's recent, maybe grandfather. I said, who was it? And she said, Adam Brown. Captured 1764 during Pontiac's Rebellion. Taken to Upper Sandusky Village, on to Detroit. Adopted, marries, becomes a warrior. Uh, has children. The town of Brownsville, Michigan is named after him. Never goes home, never goes back. If you were searching the archives, it says he's dead. He wasn't dead. And I said, well, Julie, I, I, I don't recognize the name. I got a list of maybe 45, 50 white people that I know didn't come back. And she said, what? She says, you, you got the story wrong. Hundreds were adopted. Hundreds never came back. Hundreds. I said, wait a minute. History doesn't say that. She says, it's hundreds. How do you know that? She said, we, we Indians know our white ancestors through oral tradition. And she started rattling off names I had never heard of before. And I grabbed a pencil and I'm trying to write them down. And uh, soon after that contact with her, because I got my mind turned, she, you know, she stood me on my head. You, know, you don't know what you're talking about, sort of thing. And then uh, uh, I, uh, there's a book came out by a fellow named Ian Steele, and, and this guy wrote, this guy was some kind of lion of research, and we spent 10 years just researching captive stories. And he estimated up until the year 1765, he's not even taking in the last 15 years, he estimated 4,000 were captured, 1,200 never came back, or unaccounted for. And he believed that they were not dead. Say history said they were dead. And so two questions come up in my mind. What is wrong with the story, with history? Why hasn't history looked into that? And of course, I almost answered it in the same because it was racism. And we're going to get into that a bit. How, if Indians were so hated, why would a white person turn their back on their own people stay with Indians. Okay? Couldn't accept that. Number one. And the second question is, is why did they stay? What was it about Native American society? Were they brainwashed? You know, uh, Julie reminded me, she said, you know, there was 10 years of peace. 
between uh, 1764 and 1774. Captives came and went. Nobody held them against their will. Many came back, many went back. You see? The story's a little wrong. And so that got me, uh, got me thinking about it. And, and so what I'm going to do here tonight, I want to paint a picture for you. We're going to roll the clock back. What was colonial society like? Where these captives came from? What happened to them in the course of being captured? And, uh, uh, and what was Native American society like? There's, there, there's no book you can go to. You know, we can't, I was telling uh, uh, Erica, uh, there's no library you can go in and I can say, hey, would you give me that book off the shelf there, the uh, Wyandotte Captive, 1770 to 1780, and what, while you're at it, get the Shawnee one too. It doesn't exist. These people were presumed dead, you see. And so uh, uh, I want to paint both sides so that we can come to an answer to those two questions for you. Uh, what was this racism? Let's start right there. Uh, we're seeing things now through a, the lens of today, where we all understand the word what racism. Uh, if you were born and raised back then in white society, uh, the things that you held, the belief system you held uh, about Indians was something you didn't question. You see, very few people questioned, the Quakers did, but very few. People of color in the 18th century, skin color, are considered inferior. I don't care whether you're French, Dutch, Portuguese, English, Spanish. People of color around the world are considered inferior. Inferior people you can enslave. Inferior people you can kill or you can exile them. And see, those things happen in the course of history. And, uh, because Indians were considered less than human by being uh, uh, these people of color. I, I want to read two quotes. A uh, fellow, uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, uh, 1800, said, uh, American Native peoples must be assigned a lower position in the human scale. Native Americans have skulls and brains of barbarians. We must help them grow their skulls towards civilization. So that's a reflection of the view back then. Uh, another fellow said uh, that this race, the Ar Aborigines of America, they are destined to a speedy and final extinction. They're not going to die off by, uh, uh, like the dodo bird. They're going to be killed off, is what he's saying. And of course, the most blatant one, the only good Indian I know is a dead Indian. And, and that's come to me through history. And the only reason I'm quoting these is, is just to give you an idea of what, uh, of what this was. Let's go down real quick. Why? Indians didn't speak English. They spoke all these collection of languages that sounded like gibberish to white people. That, that sounded permanent. Uh, Indians couldn't read or write. They didn't have any lang written language of their own. You know, that's, in, in, the, in the eyes of Europeans, that's, that's a primitive people. They don't have a language. Uh, they don't have, they appeared not to have any centralized government. It looked like no government. You know, there's, no, there's no king of the Delaware. There's no pope of the, of the Shawnee. There's no president of the Wyandotte. You see, you can't find that. Of course, that is a sign of tribal people. They, even today, have decentralized government. And people didn't understand that. But that's what tribal people do today. Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, decentralized, and although it looks like no government, uh, tribal people, and that's who Native America, that's who Indians were. There was many clans inside a tribe. Sometimes the clans didn't agree with each other. I just read a book, the Apache. There was, I think, seven tribes of the Apache. The Western ones didn't even know one of the tribes, the Mescalero, existed. See, that's the distance of, in tribal people sometimes. Uh, you know, I've talked to many veterans from Afghanistan who say, you know, 
the idea of Afghanistan, a country, is only in white people's heads. They don't care about Afghanistan. They have, they're loyal to the Pashtuns. That's a tribe. The Uzbeks. That's a tribe. They don't care about it. anything else. And English people in this country didn't realize it had only been a thousand years prior that English people were tribal. The Picts, the Scots, the Angles, the Saxons, the Celts. See, those were tribal people. The Goths in Europe. Um, so English people came from tribal people. Uh, another big strike though, no Christian religion. I'm not being judgmental. I'm saying uh, in 18th century, Christianity was, was very rigid. And, and rigid in that if Indians didn't know of the Bible and didn't know of Jesus, there's a problem with that. And it's their problem. They're pagan. And we're not going to accept them as anything near and equal. You say, uh, Indians, very commonly, uh, you know, it's, some white people report, they said, we, we have our own God. We have the Great Spirit. We don't need your religion. Uh, but imagine a shaman putting on a cap, a leather cap. And when he wears it, he has, he's able to heal. Or he gets visions, premonitions, or he sees. Imagine trying to explain that to a Christian minister at Fort Henry. But it's not going to go over too well. He's going to say, what? Uh, there was no industry. You couldn't go visit a factory where they're making arrows. And you say, oh, and no, they, they switched over to it. Now they're making, uh, they're making spears today. You see, they're, or, uh, they make so many an hour. Uh, there, was no, there was no factories. There was no looms to weave cloth. There was no metallurgy that you could make guns, steel knives. Thoughts. Must be primitive people. They're being judged by material culture. I'm talking now 21st century. But people back then didn't, they just said, well, they're, they're primitive. So they're savage. Uh, there was no schools, no institutions of higher learning. If, I, if, if you wanted to go meet a, a PhD Shawnee to discuss philosophy with, I, you're not going to find her. You know, they, they, it wasn't there. Uh, they had an oral tradition. They told stories that went down for generations. They still do today. Um, what I learned a lot that I learned when working with the Wyandotte is from their chief arch archivist comes from oral tradition stories that have been told. Uh, vengeance was a big thing to native people, big thing. It's a big thing to tribal people. Pakistan, uh, all these countries. Vengeance is high at the top, tribal people. Vengeance means it's your, the male's moral duty he stakes his life on to right a wrong that's been committed against his family, his clan, his tribe. You have to seek revenge. And white people said, wait a minute, don't you have sheriffs? You know, can't they be arrested? You know, that didn't exist in Native society, but, you know, it sounds a little like something in the Bible, the Old Testament, eye for an eye. That's what vengeance was to Native people, and they would carry a grudge forever. Eye for an eye. My brother was harmed by a, a Cherokee. Someday I'm going to meet a Cherokee and seek revenge and right that wrong. See, uh, Indians fought very savagely, savagely in war. I've touched on that. Uh, white people couldn't understand it. They, they thought it was fighting cowardly to fight from ambush. They won't stand up and fight us. You know, they'd rather skulk around. Um, they were outnumbered, 10 to 1. They used hit and run tactics in war. Uh, I've read many accounts in the British archives that a war party, if a, if a warrior had been wounded, they'd turn around and go home. Cornstalk stopped the battle at Point Pleasant. They were winning, but stopped because too many warriors had been lost. To them, the warrior, the, the life was precious. 
they could see the white people, hey, if they, not, if they killed 50 today, there'll be 50 more to take their place. Uh, and so, uh, you know, funny thing, I just read a, uh, an account in Iraq. We're using small unit tactics that go behind the lines, that strike like lightning, that get out before the enemy knows they're there. That's Indian tactics. Why? They worked. That's they worked. And so, uh, most important in this in this view about Indians was when it came to something that white people wanted, land, the most important thing was Native people entirely did not believe in private ownership. That is true. Uh, they collectively, you know, and I said earlier, they fought for their land. Well, wait a minute, I'm not, no, there's no inconsistency. They collectively believed that the Great Spirit had given this ground to them but not that an individual should own it. And white people looked at that and said, you know, they don't understand the value of land. We better do something about that. Let's take it off them. We value land and the resources. They don't. See, this is this disparity in, in, in uh, vision. Okay, uh, let's dig a little deeper here. I'm, I'm painting the picture once I'm gonna get the other side here. Uh, a little deeper here, what was colonial life like? that if you woke up tomorrow morning and you're at, at, the, at the little settlement of Wheeling or you're up at uh, Holiday's Cove or you're in the blockhouse down at Great Creek, how do you view the world if you're a white person? You know, what are you carrying in your head? What's your belief system? Number one, you're part of a class structure that is vertical. 18th century was vertical. There was the rich at top, the aristocrats, okay, the gentry, the politicians, the governing people who had bought commissions, whatever, the military people, the trades people, the farmers, and it's questionable who's, in what order the last two, indentures or slaves at the bottom. Slaves had value you paid money for. Indentures had a contract that could be tore up. My ancestor came here as an Irish indenture. In this class structure, there is no vertical movement. You don't move up. If you're a washerwoman, indenture, and you, and you have daughters, they're gonna be washerwomen. If you're a cooper making, uh, making barrels, I think that's what they're called, uh, you're, you're going to teach your son how to do that. Your children are not going to marry aristocrats or gentry. There's no upward movement. It's very rigid. Uh, there is, you're born, or bo even on the frontier, you're born, you live, you die in the same class. Uh, my ancestor uh, couldn't read or write to, the, to the, you know, we never had that opportunity. So land ownership is everything. You don't have money. On the front, you're here for land. Land makes you, land is money, it is value. You're here because you can't get any over the mountains. You know, it's a small matter that it's somebody else's land. Uh, you're here because it, it uh, land is everything. And uh, it's part of this, it's woven into the religion of the time. Uh, this is manifest destiny. God wants white people to tame this country, to tame nature. It's a wilderness. You know, you're, you're going to do it with your sweat. You're going to work hard. These were very rugged people on the frontier. You know, they, they, they each person, you know, they're, they're very tough. They were used to hardship. So, uh, and again, that, that Christian view worked in there because uh, there was no room for mysticism. You know, you went to church. God, this is part of God's plan. Christian God. Christian people banded. They may have argued, Presbyterians argued with the Lutherans or the Quakers. But they were in agreement on one thing. There's no room for pagan religion and we'll have none of it. No mysticism, no spirituality, none of that. Uh, because... 
to, uh, this was the age of reason. You know, this is a, 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 a world that's built on cause and effect. If you work hard, you can open up another acre of ground. Uh, everything has a reason. And, and, uh, the world was looked at conceptually, even on the frontier. Uh, there's a problem with all this that you think about while you're lying in bed. And the problem is there's Indians. They're in the way. They're in the way of this manifest destiny that we're all, that white people are going to carve this out. They're holding land and they're in the way. And when they put up a fight, they become hated. You see? From the native point of view, you know, it, it's, they're, they're doing what we would do here. If somebody came into Bel Air and said, gee, we like this place here, you know, let's uh, and start pushing people out, would you fight? So you, you fight for what you want. Uh, Indians were never adopted. Never. They were killed. This became a war and a brutal war, and, and, and they were hated. And even Negro slaves had more work. You know, you, you, today you want to farm a, you know, you need a tractor. You buy a new tractor, you, you don't leave it out in the weather. You know, you change the oil. You bought a slave, that slave's going to work your ground to produce a crop that's going to make you money. It's going to maybe buy another acre of ground. So you took care of slaves. Indians could not be enslaved. They refused. They'd starve themselves to death. So they had no worth. They had no worth. And they're in the way. So uh, when war breaks out, you see, the view becomes that they're dehumanized. They have no value. Their next step is dehumanized. Uh, there's no other way that white people can look at them unless they can be converted, and they're not going to be converted to the white man's way. Uh, and so when war comes, they're viewed as monstrous savages when they attack the frontier. Now, uh, when an Indian attacked a, a cabin and a family, say, they're, they're, uh, they're savage murderers. When a white man killed an Indian, he's a hero. The more Indians he killed, who was Wetzel, the greater the hero. And this sounds judgmental, but I'm saying if you live there, this is how, how you view things. We've got to get rid of Indians, and we're going to get rid of Indians. Uh, let's take a second now, more than a second, and let's look at the other side of the coin, because you've got to see that. that. What I've just described is where captives came from. And on the frontier, most people captured were somewhere in the farmer down to the, there were many uh, African Americans captured, work in the fields, there were many uh, indentures captured. He said, this is where they came from. Where did they go? What was 18th century Native American life like? There's hardly anything you can find written by white people that that's exists or that is accurate. And that is because in that time, white people didn't go visit Indians. You see? Uh, the very few, the traders out of Fort Pitt would go to the Shawnee and the Wyandotte, take a string of, of horses with goods, um, <coughs> and stay overnight, <coughs> speak the language. They got to know Native Americans, but they were illiterate. These traders, they, couldn't, they didn't sit down and say, Wait a second, I'm, I'm, I'm working on chapter nine here. Uh, you know, they, they couldn't, they didn't know the, you know, they couldn't write. Uh, uh, the other people were emissaries and captives, people who were living with the Indians. There's only about six captive stories written post-war where captives came back and wrote about it. So, so there's, there's very little known. Now, Native Americans, today know what their society is like. And let me outline some of these things. Where colonial was a rigid class structure, native is horizontal. Everybody's basically equal. 
equal. People of standing in a, in a tribe earned there. They didn't buy their way. They weren't appointed. Oh, it's your turn now to be chief. They earned it in battle. They earned it in diplomacy. If they were wrong, if they made bad decisions, they were demoted. And somebody else had a big hand in getting them there. And guess who that was? Women. Because Native society was matriarchal. And it wasn't just matriarchal that you got your name from your mother's side. It was matriarchal that women ran the show until the very late 1780s, or 1780s. Native society just broke down, the, the, the crush of war finally. Uh, but clan mothers who were mature women had a big say in what's going on in the, in the clan or tribe. And clan mothers would get together. It was clan mothers who decided what happens to captives when they come back. It's clan mothers who said, contrary to what white people thought, no warrior touches a, a white captive woman. It is forbidden. They were not raped. They were not raped. You go out to western Mississippi now, if you were a woman captured by the, by the Comanche, uh, you would be gang raped in the first 15 minutes. That's their way of saying, hi, uh, we're the Comanche. So, uh, standard fare. She would know. Why did the clan mother say that? Because they're looking at women of childbearing age as potential wives and mothers to be. Because adoption was a, was, was a rule. So if a warrior even tried to, uh, he, would be, he would be exiled. He, he would be forced out of the village. He would lose all face, all standing, everything. Women were not raped. Clan mothers decided at the edge of the village when a, a war party brought in captives. They would decide adoption or ransom, and in a few cases, death. And death was to men, the enemy. See, they knew them. They knew that us guys, we're not going to adopt us. We're the enemy. We hate him. They know that. It was, with few exceptions. And one of them, that's a humorous story. Daniel Boone was captured in 1778, Blue Licks, uh, by the Shawnee. I think it was. Black Snake uh, captured him and I said, Boy, I, I like him. I want to adopt him. Shawnee said, No, no, no. Won't work. And he took a liking to Daniel Boone. And Daniel Boone, being Daniel Boone, because Black Snake said, you know, I want him to replace my son. Daniel Boone uh, said, Hi, Dad and bided his time until he could escape. And Black Snake lost face because they came to him and said, this is why we don't adopt white men. This is war. You can't, you, you're any more than a white person could adopt an Indian and, and, and have them become a white person. He said. Uh, so it was clan mothers that decided that, guess what, if there's divorce, well, in marriage, if, you, if a guy marries a woman, they move into the mother's sphere, maybe her lodge, maybe next to her lodge. The grandmother's there, the sisters, everybody. It's an extended family. And in the event of divorce, because she owns everything, he would get kicked out. He takes nothing with him, but maybe his bow and arrow or musket and his knife. And he goes back to his own people. And if there's any children, uh -uh. They stay with her. That was the true traditional matriarchal society. Women decided when there was war, not men. The clan mothers would get together. A war party formed. Somebody's been there's been some wrong committed. You know they they go to the clan mother. We got to avenge this. We're going to go to war against the Cherokee. There was a, and the clan mother said, "War? Wait a second. We'll get back to you. We're going to talk this over. And, uh, and the next day, you know, the warriors are waiting, waiting, and they say, um, the clan mother would speak, to, and she said, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go hunt. Go hunt. Enough war. We mothers 
give birth to the warriors, and we mothers bury the warriors, and you men don't know yourselves, you would fight until there's nobody left in this tribe. So no more. Go hunt. So, and, that, and that helped until late, late in the game. And so, uh, true, there was no private ownership of land. They believed that everything that we see in this world was given to all living things to share. And there's a quote I, I came across where I, uh, um, in order to try to explain this to some white people, when you grabbed a handful of dirt and you said, how can you own this any more than the bird owns the sky it flies through, or the fish owns the water that it swims in? You don't own anything. We're here at the behest of the Great Spirit. So we, all we can do, we're here at this moment to share. And uh, uh, to them, uh, everything manifest had the Great Spirit in it. Uh, they lived in a world where they honored that on a daily basis, and still do today. I, I was out in Zuni, New Mexico, I was telling Erica, and, and, and they still, they pray in the morning that, you know, that the sun's come up, that they're here another day, that the Great Spirit has allowed us. See, they understand they're not running the show, uh, so to speak. They believed in, the har in, in harmony with nature. They were in harmony with nature, not hostile to nature. See, white people, nature, going out in the woods, the dark woods, that's hostile. And to native people, that's their backyard. They were in harmony with it, with everything in that world. And, uh, and they knew then, as they know today, traditional people, and I've had a couple talks with, uh, with people, uh, they knew that the white men's, white minds, think differently than them. That the white mind conceptualizes. Um, I had a, I got stood on my head. I've been stood on my head many times by, by Native people. And I got stood on my head by a woman who's only about this tall. And uh, she was uh, making jewelry. And we got into a discussion. And I'd been to a corn dance. This is out in uh, New Mexico. And, and uh, I asked her to explain some things. And, and she said, well, you wouldn't understand. I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, here I am. I'm trying to understand. She said, well, you're white. I said, wait a second now. What's that got to do with it? She said, from the time you were this big, see, I didn't see this coming. From the time you were this big, you were raised in an educational system that's given a word to everything in this world until this has become so dominant that you are now separated from the reality of spirit. And wow. She said, our religion, our world is from here, not from here. She tapped her from the heart. You know, that stood me on my head. I realized, no, I don't understand. Uh, that they, uh, they could see that the white mind was closed to their, their worldview. They knew that. You know, there was, they, it's not hard to guess. Uh, they believed in the importance of dreams, the Jesuits, the, French Jesuits tried to stamp that out. They believed that there's a spirit world, that you could get messages. The thing with the feathers in the hair, the bird, uh, is a messenger from the spirit world. It'll give you visions. You'll, uh, uh, you might get messages. You might hear something. See, this was all a connection they believed in because of, of who they were. They were a tribal people. Uh, they... Uh, uh, they believed that that the clan is all that is important, the family and clan, and that uh, in return, the individual who's not important in Native society is given a connectedness, a connectedness that did not exist in colonial society, and it still exists today. Uh, there was a sense of belonging, and I felt this. I was at Zuni, Zuni, Zuni Pueblos on the Arizona and New Mexico. And I stayed there for four days, and I, I know some people there. And if you want to stay in your white, there's only there's a one place that has eight beds, and that's it. And it's in a what was a, an old trading post, and, and and outside there's a town, and there's a courtyard that has a six foot high wall around it. And I asked the guy running it one day. I said. 
because I would come and go and you know talk to people. I said, what, why the wall? I said, well, you white people need fences. See, and I, at first I thought he was being, he was, you know, he was, he was being insulting. No, he knew white people. He, when you go outside into the Pueblo, there's no fences. There's none. There's a community. There's an extended family. Everybody knows everybody else. There's several thousand people. It's a community. You know, I've, I've got a community. I, I live in a community. Here's my neighbor. He's got, you know, he says, here's the property line. That's mine. That's yours. Stay off of <laughs> And we go into our house, uh, and we're a bunch of individuals who have no connection to each other whatsoever. We're in competition, you know, he's got a new law, it's bigger than mine. I push it, he's rising right now. See, that's the, that, that's, that's the difference. In, in Native society, traditionally, and, and back in then, everyone, and if you were adopted, you became a part of that, of this community, and you'll hear the word used, the people. The people. There's nothing in our language, really, that has the same meaning. Yes, we understand the words, the people, but it has the same meaning. The people made that each person in that tribe has a connection to each other. And, and that's one of, the, one of the things of tribal people, uh, uh, this interconnectedness. Uh, there was a division of labor in Native society. Uh, men went to war, uh, men hunted, uh, women did domestic and agriculture. And the downfall happened pretty quick, not just war, something else interceded. And that was a dependency that grew overnight to white man's goods. Material culture entered native culture. And a, a gun was easier to hunt with, a, pot, a metal pot's easier to cook with. A steel knife doesn't break like a, a flint knife could get clothes and didn't have to dress the skin. And uh, uh, so Indians became dependent upon the material culture, but nothing else with it. And somebody asked, a, asked at the time, asked an Indian, why, why don't you become like white people? And the answer was, a fish was never intended by the great spirit to adopt the life of a bird. There's a lot of wisdom in that, psychological wisdom in that. Uh, they knew they weren't uh, white people. They knew they couldn't become. And so, uh, what were the reasons for adoption? Why was there adoption? Why didn't the Indians just kill every white man, woman, and child? Sometimes women and children were killed. It's war. Let's not forget the context. It's war. Somebody's going to win. It's a war. It is a, it was ethnic cleansing. They're going to wipe out one side or the other. These two cultures are not going to get together and say, okay, all right, war's over. Uh, you know, we'll have that over there, we'll have that. Too many broken treaties, too many uh, misunderstandings. So adoption occurred during years of these terrible wars. And I've said somewhere around 4,000 over a period of 40 years, 4,000 were brought back to villages. The adoption uh, was done, why? why? Why do this? Why would warriors bring back, all the, bring back these captives to be adopted? Because they were outnumbered 10 to 1. Because they were outnumbered in war. They didn't have the guns. They didn't have the warriors. They took casualties. Their population is dropping, and they're outnumbered for another reason, because when those traders come to your village with those shiny pots and pans and guns and everything, they're bringing something else that you can't see. They're bringing white man's disease that Indians had no immunity for. Smallpox, influenza, measles, and a half dozen others. These, it would be like somebody coming to Belair here comes in this room tonight, has a virus we don't know about. And in 10 days, the whole town is sick. And in two weeks, a third are dead. 
And just when we get back on our feet, six months later, another disease comes and a third dies. This happened repeatedly and repeatedly. The population was estimated that pre-Columbus, there were somewhere between seven and 10 million Indians just in North America. And that by 1900, 400 years later, there's less than 250,000. So that's what contact with whites did. I'm not placing a value judgment. I'm just saying that's what happened. And so, uh, and something else happened along the, in, in the same vein. As white people moved into prime hunting lands like Kentucky, elk and deer and all, it became harder to hunt there. So you hunted more towards back on this side of the Ohio. But the closer you get to home, the less game there is. So the diet changed during these four years. There's less protein. <clears throat> less protein means something. Something big. We got to supplement it, so, yeah, squash and corn and all that. But it means that women found they couldn't carry as many pregnancies to term. It was having an effect on the population. So adoption which had been around before the white men. This is not something Indians dreamed up. It's a, oh, well, yeah, let's adopt. Uh, they've been doing it back with the Iroquois Wars back in the 1600s. Uh, adoption was a way of, if the person took to them, of uh, not increasing the population, just holding steady. They're trying to survive. They're trying to hang on to their culture. There's war, perpetual war. Uh, and there was no taboo against interracial marriage. You know, if you're back at if you're back at Wheeling there, and you're a guy and you bring an Indian girl home, I don't think uh, that's going to. I think there's going to be a problem on many, many, you know, many, many levels. Uh, but there was no taboo in Native society. By 1780, there was no pure blood left. They had been adopting and intermarrying. There was Negro, African American. There were uh, French. Uh, there were uh, uh, other tribes. And so this had been a practice that had worked. Now, uh, if you were adopted, what happened? You know, what was adoption? We differed from different tribes. But you would go through a ceremony, and the ceremony was one of washing away your previous life. And symbolically washing away your previous skin color. You see, now if you're a captive, you know, this has been traumatic. It's a clan mother who decides that. See? Uh, they need to be into the village. It's been a traumatic you're captured near a woman, it's been traumatic. You're taken by force. You don't say, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I agree. No, they take you by force. And this is war. Um, and so um, the ceremony that they would put you through, you, you wouldn't know the language. But you would be adopted, not just adopted, I mean, set loose in the truck. A family would take you to replace someone who had died. A family that loved you. It's hard for us to comprehend. It doesn't make any sense. And, and uh, this was all done because of survival. It was a way of surviving. Uh, so, we're getting down to this last question. Why not go back to colonial society? Many did. Many went back and came back after living with Indians. And one of the, the things that white historians said, well, they were held against the rule, they couldn't come back. Not true. There's periods of peace. There's traitors come and go, captives come and go. The Gertie brothers, the three, the three boys on the cover, are now dead on the cover of my first book, uh, were from uh, uh, close to the Harrisburg area of Pennsylvania. They lived eight years with the Indians. They were captured during the French and Indian War. They went back to Fort Pitt. Okay? They come back. The two youngest couldn't speak English. Simon could. Uh, they were, guess what they found out? They weren't accepted. They couldn't fit in. 
white people shunned them. White people said, there's too much engine in you. There's too much red devil in you. Words like that. See, this is where this, you know, this, they bumped up against white society. They couldn't fit in. Uh, now guess what if you were a woman and came back after living eight years with the Indians or five years? What do you think people think of you? They know what they know what you did. And come back with mixed blood children, you know, you're really risking their lives. You would not be accepted. Uh, if a child had been captured and comes back to Fort Pitt, and he's now 15, 16, 17, and there's no family to accept him, he was sold into indenturism to pay his bill for his keep. So he had somebody who was there with the government and said, yeah, I'll take her or I'll take him of seven years as a cobbler or seven years. They were sold into indenturism. And if you were an indenture yourself, if you're the washerwoman who comes back, makes the mistake of coming back, or you're the African-American Negro slave who comes back, guess who's waiting for you? The person who owns you. Doesn't matter that you spent all those years with the Indians. Uh-uh. You got five years left on your contract. Or you're my slave. I paid good money for you. You went back to slavery. They knew this because there's commerce. Traders told them. You know, it's, it's not a, there's not a, uh, there was a lot of talk going on. Uh, there was a belief, as far as the women went. If you're standing here in front of us after five years with the Indians, you didn't resist enough. You didn't try to escape. You would have been better off dead than coming back here. So many, many went back to the Indians. Uh, the youngest brother here, I'm sorry, the middle brother, James Gurdy. James Gurdy had lived with the Shawnee later in life, much later in life, because he went back to the Indians, all three did, at the start of the American Revolution. And they asked him, why'd you go back to the Indians? And he said, I went back to the only people who truly loved me and accepted me for who I am. They wouldn't accept me. So, so uh, uh, a white man noticed, and it's on the cover of my book, or the back of the book, uh, noticed that the people who did come back, who went back, had been changed. They weren't the same. And he said, this guy was literate, and he wrote, he said, it's easy, I believe it's easy to make an Indian out of a white man, but hard, if not impossible, to reclaim a white man after they're being converted. And there's the answer to the question. Conversion. After being converted. After being converted. What was he talking about? That put such an indelible mark on these former white people who didn't seem at all like they were white anymore. They came back. Uh, conversion. That's what we're talking about. Let me give you an example. There's a fellow from the archives, an Indian, a Wyandotte Indian named Coon, C-O-O-N, one of the most feared war captains in the American Revolution, raided this side of the river, the West Virginia side. Uh, Half King sent him out, uh, hated whites, his real name was Abraham Kuhn, K-U-H-N. He'd been, he'd been captured and adopted. He was from Pennsylvania. He was a German family in Pennsylvania. Never went back, intermarried, fought with, so he fought with the Indians. A good example of what conversion looked like. So Abraham Kuhn. Uh, what were the steps, all right? Adoption. You were adopted into a loving family. That's a genuine thing. They didn't adopt you and say, hey, all the firewood for them 20 years. 
you weren't a slave, although I'm saying in general, and, and there were some Indian, some Indians had slaves, uh, but you were adopted into a family, unlike what you would think in a colonial, who, if you replaced a lost son or daughter, they loved you like a son or daughter. And so did the extended family, and you ate with them, um, and you, you became a part of that greater communal setting. There's really nothing in colonial society to match it. You say there's no, we don't, uh, they became part of the, of, of, of the people. And as they learned the language, that gave life to it. They were now somebody, not a nobody washerwoman or nobody Irish indenture. I say that because my ancestor came in a boat from Cornwall, that's all I know. And they listed indentures. They said, so many passengers, so many uh, horses, so many head of cattle, and so many Irish indentures. Unnamed. See, they were nobody. Uh, that's colonial society at the time. Uh, so, learning the language, you now were able to share in the experience. You understood the heritage, the, the ancient ways. You understood the uh, religion. Language was a binder, was a real binder. Uh, the native experience became a lot. It had meaning now. You were no longer an outsider in that Indian village. You were an insider. Uh, and uh, I had a, uh, an experience in Santa Fe with a, uh, uh, a Tiwa uh, young man who, uh, who was a dancer in a, uh, what they call a buffalo dance. And, uh, and I stood next to him and he, uh, he wasn't teaching me anything. He was reliving it in memory and uh, the shake of the rattle and the step, this all had meaning. To the outsider like me, I, I don't understand him. You know, this well, I got a glimpse into his head. He, this was, you know, his, this was his world that he lived in. Uh, so the singing, the language, the dancing, the, the tradition connected that individual. What was this conversion, brainwashing? They didn't come back and say, and there's not one instance that they came back to Fort Pitt and said, "Gee, you know, I was brainwashed." I'm, I'm, you know, what was I thinking? I'm glad that's over. It was indelible mark on them. They couldn't live with white people. They had converted body, heart, mind, and soul. They did not see themselves any longer as white. Abraham Kuhn, Kuhn in British Archives, was Wyandotte, was one of the people. Their former life, their former white skin, to them that all fell off. Uh, that had no place. And if they went back, and many did, it had no meaning. They'd meet their mother. No. Their mother was in the village. James Gordy said, and I went back to the people of Buffalo. And so this conversion, this is what happened to more than 1,400 and why they didn't come back. There's, uh, and there's many, many, many instances. Uh, I put through some of them. There's the washerwoman, Maggie. And, and this was a real person who stated to another captive in a village, was trying to explain to a recently brought in woman. She says, I, I was a washerwoman. I'm, I'm beholden to no one now. I can come and go as I please. You see? Uh, there, uh, Adam Brown took a, a Wyandotte name. There were many who were translators, who became uh, some were mixed club, who knew the language. Uh, and the, the final thing I'm going to say is about, in the cover of the book, uh, Cece Rose, uh, the artist did all my cover, Cece Rose did this. There was a boy from Wheeling. I said, boy, he was a teenager. The year 1781. It's in April, somewhere at that, I think in April. And uh, there's a war going on. No Indian war parties have been seen. He's out on the river fishing. He disappears. His family thinks he's drowned. He's captured by Shawnee. They didn't know there's war parties watching the fort. 
from the other side. They didn't even know they're there. And he's taken to a village, and we wouldn't know what happened to him if it wasn't for somebody you might have heard of. Have you heard of McKee's Rocks, Pittsburgh? Alexander McKee was a white man from there who had a Shawnee wife, his father had been a traitor. He went over to the Indians when the war, American Revolution started. He's literal. He's something rare on the frontier. He can write, and write he does. And he happens to be in the village when the warriors bring in this boy, Bryce Reagan. And he writes a letter. He sits him down. He says, who are you? Where are you from? How many men are in the fort? When did they last get supplies from Fort Pitt? Where's George Rogers' car? She's gaining military intelligence, and he writes us all down, sends it to Detroit. It ends up in the British Archives. Nine months later, runs into Bryce Reagan again. He says, he's been adopted by a prominent Shawnee family and is now a volunteer fighting with him. Bryce Reagan went to war with the Shawnee. And what his family didn't know, because the Reagan family, we know, was in the fort in the last stage, 1782. What they don't know is their sons on the outside is a lot. You see? But if you search Bryce Reagan, he died on the river. He drowned. No, never came back. And so that is what happened uh, to them. Uh, they assimilated into Native society. And uh, their descendants live in Oklahoma. And if you ever go through Oklahoma, on the, uh, you go from Santa, or, uh, St. Louis down to Oklahoma City, You'll go, there's a big sign that says, uh, you are now entering the Delaware Nation, and you're now entering the Wyandotte. They were here. That's where we were. 